Warfare is every day for us. The boot camp was getting saved and coming from the milk to the meat. Because to be a strong, mature Christian, you have to survive a lot of temptations, didn't you? Still do. But you know, the stronger your immune system is, the greater your walk will be, and there'll be more fruit in your walk. But you know, there's just thousands and thousands of times that you come to that fork in the road, and you have to decide what you're going to do. And when you're a new Christian, you just don't have that root system yet to know how to do it in a way that's a godly answer. You're trying to translate what the Bible says into the immediate need in this situation. And wouldn't you just love to have a seasoned Christian with you there all the time to say, what should I do? But you don't. But who do you have? The Holy Spirit is right in you. Now, if you didn't put the deposit of the Word in first, you didn't give him much to work with. So if you're ever like in Japan and you don't know the language, in the old days you used to have to get out your little book and look up the words. Now it's so easy. You just speak into a phone in English and it translates out to them for, for Japanese. It's amazing, isn't it? It's how it should be for us with the Lord. Every situation we walk into, we're not sure what to do, that we have like instant translation of how I should handle this situation in this moment. I call that a moment of truth. When you're not sure what to do, you come up on a situation and you're at that fork in the road. How many do 100% right thing every time? <laughs> no hands are going up. But don't you want your average to go up? You want to keep doing better at what the Lord would want, not what I would want, not what my flesh would want, but what the Lord would want. That's the moment of truth I'm talking about. And that's a third day situation because you're not in training camp anymore. This isn't a scrimmage. We're not playing against our own team. This is the enemy trying to take me out. It might not look like it. It might just be a business meeting. It might be somebody setting you up in a business meeting. And they're waiting for you to say something that they can use against you. Not that that would ever happen in corporate America. Right? It happens all the time. If they see talent in you, they might feel threatened by that. And now all of a sudden you walk in thinking, you know, Gomer Pyle, gullible. Oh, everybody's got the best interest for everybody else. Well, you know, not always. No, you're not working with Christians. So be wise as a serpent, but gentle as a dove. So that's not easy, is it? That's why I love this next one, but I'll tell you. This is one of my favorite portions of Scripture. It's from 2 Samuel 23. You got it up there, right? And I've, I've shared from this before, but it's just too important not to get the point across, and it paints such a great picture. So David had just died, and the author of 2 Samuel is listing his mighty men. How many knew about that group of men, mighty men that David had in battle, right? Because he was a mighty warrior. Great example of a worshiper and a warrior. He had a soft side, but he also knew how to kill the enemy. That's the picture that the Christians are supposed to have. And we, we really haven't done a great job on the killing the enemy part. The American church is much better at nurturing and gathering together and being here. This is great. It's really important. But we're supposed to be training you for the warfare that goes on when you're here and when you're outside of here. Because it goes on in here too, doesn't it? All right. So that's where we want to up our game. That's what the season of the summer, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. I'm going to give you the land, but you're going to have to rule the land or else the enemy will run you over. And ruling the land takes responsibility and courage and takes difficult decisions in that moment of truth. You can't walk away in your third day. You can't turn away when that rubber meets the road and you have to decide what to do. And this guy, wow, the first one listed. It says in 2 Samuel 23, 8, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshub, and it was a longer name after that, but I just took the first part. Chief among the captains. you got to say this with me. He had killed. <laughs> what? He killed 800 men at one time. That's in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, it's true. <laughs> okay? That's why he's at the top of the list. Because that doesn't sound like a walk in the park, does it? One guy killed 800 men. So... That's who you want on your side. That's who you have on your side. How many were here during intercession today? <laughs> that was fired up, wasn't it? Aren't you glad they're on your side? 
Because when you have a need, that's who's praying for you. Not some wishy-washy prayer, oh Lord, if it's your will. We got to know his will. It's already in here. What his will is, you got to know it and then speak it out and declare it and proclaim it. So he killed 800. Then the second guy listed is the, really the one I want to talk about. His name is Eleazar. But, you know, out of the mighty men, there were three top guys. This is number two. Not bad, number two. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastimon for battle. Then the Israelites retreated. Not a good thing, is it? You're there and you're taunting, and all of a sudden the people that are with you lose their nerve. And they flee. What do you do? Hmm, not so easy, is it? When everybody else is running in the other direction and you're a warrior, if you're one of David's mighty men, you're at a moment of truth. And you've got to decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to run with the rest of the cowards? Sorry, we're warriors. We're in battle now. This is the game. This isn't a scrimmage anymore. We're not in boot camp. They're dropping real bombs on us. Okay? I don't want to be with a company of people that are retreating. But we do. We have, it happens to us sometimes. Look at this picture. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground. Look at your neighbor and say, stand your ground. In the moment of truth. You need to stand your ground in the moment of truth. And what did he do? He struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. <laughs> oh, man, what a picture. That's what a king and a priest is looking like. The battle's over now, Eleazar. You can let go. No, I can't. I became one with my weapon. How cool is that? That's the picture you need. That's who we are, right? Now, they probably had to peel his fingers off because his hand froze to the sword. I don't want to go to battle with anybody less than that. You know, like you read about that hell week. There's a guy named Marcus Luttrell who uh, wrote the book Lone Survivor. I had the privilege, really, of meeting him at a business meeting. He was the, the featured speaker, and I was help, helping to run the conference. And uh, he was an intense guy. And uh, he was a Navy SEAL. Both he and his twin brother were both Navy SEALs. He's 6'5", 240 pounds. Two twins. And the average size of a SEAL is about 5'8", 5'9", 160, 165 pounds because they spend so much time in the water that having that much muscle and bulk and bone, 240 pounds, is not easy when you're a Navy SEAL. And yet that's the kind of stature these guys had. And he said to us, you know, he had been on 300 deployments. And the only reason he stopped is because he was shot so many times and had so many bones broken that his body just wouldn't allow him to keep going. But his spirit man was saying, I want to be out there with my buddies. Now, he was also still in post-traumatic stress. But I'm just telling you, the, the spirit of a warrior, you couldn't help but just salute the guy. Like, you're on our side, man. I'm sure glad you're on our side. And, you know, there's the stories he told about Hell Week, but... If there was, he said, if there was one ounce in me left, I couldn't quit. And that's the only way he survived because the odds were he should have died. You know, if you read his story, you know, most of us would have said, why bother even trying to escape because there's 150 of them and there's just me and there's just no way. And what happened was a bomb landed near him and it blew him into the cleft of a rock. <laughs> How biblical is that? Right? Like... Every time he would fall down the mountain, the gun would land right next to him. It wasn't even connected. He was crawling on his elbows because everything else was broken and he had been shot. There was just no way you would keep trying. And, and he said, our motto is, if there's even one ounce left in me, you don't quit. You keep going because you never know what's going to happen. Man, I'll tell you, that changed my life. Just meeting that guy, it was like he imparted something of courage. And that's what this Eleazar did. And, you know, here's the rest of the story that's not so easy. His hand grew and froze to the sword, grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. Why? Because of the ones who retreated? No. But because of a brave, courageous Navy SEAL. 
And yet the men came back. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. That's like rubbing salt in the wound, isn't it? Because they're taking the spoils of the war without contributing. They did nothing but show cowardice, and yet they think they're entitled to some of the spoils of the war. And it doesn't say Eleazar stopped them. But I'm sure there was some conviction around, oh man, this one guy stood and we ran and he won. That's who we need to be, that person. That's the king and the priest. 